so the drop-off center uh, here in our gym is open until uh, tomorrow uh, at noon. And uh, God's just been uh, forging relationships, and I'm so grateful for those who volunteer. Um, next Sunday, uh, the 25th, uh, this place will be transformed into looking more like Christmas. So I want to encourage you to um, bring your family with you. Uh, we're going to be taking Christmas pictures before service, between service, after service. Uh, right over here, we've got a 12-foot tree coming right there. We decorated around that. We'll give you the picture if you want it for your Christmas card, but we'd love to have it to be able to put it into uh, the online uh, database so we can see your face when people want to know who you are, that they'll be able to find you and know uh, that they're seeing. We'll do that next week. We'll also do it the second, Sunday morning the second, where we have our Christmas kickoff celebration in the choir, uh, singing uh, for most of the service that day. And then uh, that evening uh, is our annual business meeting, and it will be at 5 o'clock as we progress toward Christmas. Um, we'll be having regular services on Sunday morning, the 23rd, at 9 and 10 30. And on Christmas Eve, uh, we're going to meet in here uh, at 4 and 5 30. So we'll have two services on Christmas Eve. So if you want to eat before, you can. If you want to eat after, you can. Uh, it'll be a great time of worship, honoring Christ uh, that way. And then on December 30th is a fifth Sunday, so we'll have one service, no live groups, right here at 1030 on that day. It's all in your bulletin, and so you'll be okay. Hey, before we go any further, I just want to invite you, if you would, if you brought your box with you, pick it up, hold it up, if you brought boxes with you, I just want to invite you right now, why don't you come, we're going to lay them on the altar, and we're just going to either stand there or kneel there, and we're going to pray. Uh, for the child who's going to receive those, why don't you just come with those? Just bring them right here in the front. Send them to the altar. And just stand right here. Just stay right here with it. Uh, one of my favorite pictures of the week has been watching the people when they drop off their boxes, praying over them with other <coughs> folks. So we're going to do this in both services. And yeah, just put them.
We love you. We worship you. We give ourselves fresh to you. We lay ourselves on the altar this morning as an offering to you. Do in us, through us, with us what you desire to bring yourself glory today. It's in the strong and powerful, mighty name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we pray. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks. I can't wait to hear the stories of what God does. Let's continue singing together.
power for the resurrection that gives us hope of eternal life after this. God, I thank you that uh, this is not all that there is. God, change us by the power of your word as you speak to us now. God, challenge us. May we be different. May we be different as a result of your work in us and through us today. For the glory of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. You can be saved. Ready? 
This message is about me pursuing Christ. One more time. This message is about me pursuing Christ. You ready to go? Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. Wives, be subject to your husbands. This, this is a word subject means voluntarily putting yourself under rank. It's like a military term. You've put yourself voluntarily into the service, into this rank. Being subject to your husband. As is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. The word love there is agape. This is not eros. This is not phileo. This isn't brotherly love. This is not erotic love or sexual love. This is agape, sacrificial love. The same kind of love that Jesus displayed on the cross dying for you. Verse 20. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate or embitter your children so that they do not lose heart. Verse 22. Slaves, in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will, be, will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. Masters, grant your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. There's a parallel text to this the Apostle Paul writes. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through chapter 6, verse 9. And some of this text is explained very well there. Some of that text is explained well here. And so I'll refer back and forth to it. But also, these were by the same person, by, written by the Apostle Paul. First, I want to give you three things. First of all, let's look at the three relationships here. Three relationships. Husbands and wives. Husbands and wives, verse 18. And 19. Wives be subject or put yourself under voluntarily the rank of your husband as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love, agape, your wives, and do not be embittered against them. And the first thing we've got to know is that God has a definite order for the world. God has an order for the world. This, this is just something the Apostle Paul came up with. This is God's order for the world. It hasn't changed. It was the same way in Genesis. He didn't change. This is his order for the world. And Paul starts each of these three sections. Interestingly enough, he doesn't talk to the husband first to love his wife, and then the wife to be subject or submissive to her husband. He doesn't talk with parents about being uh, good parents to their children. He starts with children of being obedient to the parents. He doesn't start to talk about slaves or even servants, work relationships by talking to the bosses. He talks to the person who's serving. And it follows really well the way that Christ te taught himself and the way the Apostle Paul teaches throughout the New Testament. Look, our submission to other people, our submission to authority reflects our submission to the authority of Christ. That's why he starts here. I really wish it would be easier to give the message today if he started the other way. But he doesn't. When we're submissive to the plan of God for family and for work, what we do is we submit to God. Ephesians 5.21 introduces the same kind of relationships in the family and talks about it and how it reflects being spirit-filled. When we're filled with the Spirit, when God's working on us, when God's controlling us, this is what it looks like. He doesn't say that it's easy, because people aren't easy. I'm a husband, I'm a dad, and I'm not easy. I'm a difficult person. And probably you are too. Most of us are. Because we're still battling this flesh. It's selfishness. We want our way. We want it to work for us. And that's tough. 
Well, we know in Colossians, we talked about it last week and the week before about the fact that being spirit-filled is the same thing as being following and having the Word of God inside of you and following God's Word. You can't have spirit-filled and not Bible. You can't. You can't have Scripture without being spirit-filled. You can't read the Bible and have knowledge of the Bible and not submit to it and still be following Christ, pursuing Him the way that He wants. You can't say, well, I'm spirit-filled and I'm following Jesus in the Spirit and I'm just watching and listening for Him tell me and then neglect what He says in His Word. They go together. They never contradict. But a wife's submission is a matter of her relationship to the Lord, not to her husband. A wife saying, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fall under the rank of the husband is, is reflective of your relationship with God, not of your relationship with your husband. Because husbands are hard to deal with. See, i got snickers again and no amens. Nobody wants to like come out and say, yeah, you're right. Husbands are hard to deal with. Some of us men need to say amen because we know it. And the model of loving is Christ. That's hard. You, it, it's, it's hard because we're challenged in trying to love that way. Even if our spouse was perfect, it would be hard to love that way. Because we don't want to love that way. But the Word of God says, husbands, we're supposed to love our wives the same way Christ loved the church. And that's hard. No matter how perfect your wife is, it's hard because we struggle with it. Ephesians 5.22 says it this way, the husband should love his wife sacrificially and that she's to be his delight. And I had to think about that in the terms of Christ. Because Christ loves me the way I'm supposed to love my wife. <coughs> Christ's delight is in me. He gets delight in me when I follow Him. When I'm in an intimate relationship with Him. When, <coughs> excuse me, when I'm loving Him and He's loving me in the way that we're supposed to and I'm submitted to Him and to His will. He gets delight in that. He delights in my submission to Him and receiving His love for me. And that's what He wants out of a husband. A husband who delights in his wife, experiencing the abundant life that God has for them. It's a delight. But what happens sometimes? What happens sometimes to us as husbands? If your wife's having a really good day and things are going well for her, and then you had a bad day. Do you delight in that? I mean, like it really make you happy. Or you're like, wish I had that kind of day. But see, Jesus doesn't look at us that way. Jesus, Jesus doesn't look at us and say, well, he had a bad day, or she had a bad day, or he had a good day, they had a good day, and then reflect on his own day. He doesn't do that. He delights in the other person. He delights in us. And that's what He wants out of us as husbands. That we would delight in our spouse. And then Paul instructs husbands not to be bitter toward or harsh toward. The, the word here is not to, but toward. I had to think about that for a while because it just didn't really make sense to me. But, you know, I'm a picture kind of guy, so when I kind of drew the picture in my mind of what the difference between being bitter or harsh to you or toward you. See, sometimes what happens is, is I, I, I know what it means to be harsh to my wife. To say something to my wife that's harsh. But what does it mean for me to be harsh toward her? See, my little legalistic mind wants to say, well, I didn't say anything bad. But how I said it, I can say I love you and break somebody's heart if I do it toward them in a harsh way. You with me? 
So the text is not only concerned with your words or your behavior, but with your attitude and how you deliver it. It really does matter. Don't be harsh or bitter toward your wife. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 26 expands on this. This is what can happen oftentimes. Is I've had a bad day. Maybe she's even had a bad day. I know my wife never has a bad day. But if she has a bad day, and I have a bad day, and then we just kind of rub each other raw, I know that doesn't happen to any of you. It happens in our house. You know, the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 4, 26, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't let it fester. Sometimes we get to the point, especially husbands, we're like, well, I didn't say anything wrong. I didn't say anything bad. But you've been acting it all night long. We just do sometimes. And the Bible tells us that we need to be the responsible parties. Each of us. To deal with it. To not let things fester. Because when you do harsh things or embitter or somebody, it doesn't get better until you deal with it. And all we can hope is is that our spouse will respond in the way that Jesus responds to us. When we repent, we confess, we ask for forgiveness. Two of the hardest words to say in marriage are, I'm sorry. I know I'm to contraction, it's really two words, and I would make three. I got it. <laughs> but for us guys, we need to simple. Two of the hardest words to say, I'm sorry. Why is that so? We don't like to say it to God. We don't like to tell God I'm sorry. That's repentance. Don't let the sun go down. We keep reading these texts in 1 Corinthians at weddings and I'm not really sure we get it. But this is the agape love that he's talking about. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It isn't proud. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. And it keeps no record of wrongs. How long is your record going right now? How long is your record of wrongs going? What does it take to get you to remember something that happened last year like one last week? See, for most of us, we got triggers, and the enemy knows what our trigger is. And because we don't deal with our bitterness or our interactions, because we don't say, I'm sorry, and get over it, and get past it, the enemy will take little triggers. And he'll bring up that record of wrongs. Husbands and wives, we both do it. Pursue Christ in our marriage says you can't. And why is it? You can't pursue Christ in your marriage and keep records of wrong. Because Jesus looks at us and he says, I forgave you and I forgot. I, I cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. I remember it no more. What right do you have to keep a record of somebody else's wrongs? And I just want to really encourage you. Pursuing Christ, pursuing Christ, pursuing Christ in a marriage reflects Christ to the world. Pursuing Christ in your marriage reflects Christ to the world. The Christ people see, the God people see in your marriage reflected is what they think God is. So, parents and children, verse 21, 22, or 20 and 21. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, but this is well-pleasing to the Lord. 
fathers do not exasperate or embitter their children so that they will not lose heart. The word here for children assumes the child is living in the home. Now, that used to be really clear and a clear line in our culture, and it's no longer that, is it? Because we often see adult children coming back and living at home. Sometimes what you see is adult children don't, not wanting to leave home. I heard somebody uh, a couple weeks ago asking about their 20-something who was about to graduate college who doesn't want to get a job and doesn't want to do anything but go to class, come home, and sit in their room and play video games. What am I going to do with that? If I told you that was a pastor, that's a problem. But it's not just a problem for a pastor, it's a problem for anybody. Listen, if your child lives at home, they live under your roof, they live under your rules, they live under you pursuing Christ. It doesn't matter how old they are. They want to move out and be on their own. Great. This doesn't necessarily apply. Now, the Ten Commandments say that we're supposed to honor our father and mother, right? That never goes away. But this is specifically speaking to children who are in the home. And it says obey. That's not the same word as submit. It's a different word. It's, it's like you don't have rights. It doesn't play well in our culture today. Because everybody's got rights. But God's word says when the child is in your home, they don't have the right to say no. I don't want to do that. I grew up and had a, a neighbor who liked to mouth off a bit, sometimes to his parents, sometimes to my mom. And uh, he, he, here was his favorite word, here his favorite phrase. I don't feel. He couldn't even get out of don't feel like it. He would say, I don't feel. What are you to do with that? We could have a whole other sermon on what the Bible said to do with that. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4 expands on this explanation, but it's the same message. It's a responsibility. This is the interesting thing. Paul assumed the kids were going to hear the message. He assumed they were going to hear the message. What does that mean? That means you got to give the kids the Word of God. He assumed they were going to hear. He was speaking directly to them. Children in the home. This is the way it works. This is the way God's economy works. If wives are supposed to submit to husbands, and husbands are supposed to love their wives, you can't say, well, that one doesn't apply. The children think this doesn't apply. You can't. He says here to parents, don't embitter your children. And what does that mean? See, only one of two times in the entire New Testament that he uses the word. The other place is 2 Corinthians 9 and 2. And the word here speaks of irritation and nagging. And, and I'm thinking about how that plays out. And I'm thinking honestly about how that played out in us and the four kids in our house. And when I thought about that, what that looks like to me is just me telling one of my children to do something about five, six times. But I just went from giving them instruction to nagging. And whose fault is that? Is it their fault or is it my fault? Come on. Whose fault is it? Their fault or mine? Yeah. I didn't ask you to take ownership of it. I you can play it on me this morning. It's my fault, isn't it? If I let them do get away with that, then I turn into the nagging irritant. But it also speaks here of a little bit different attitude of a parent. It speaks here of a parent who picks on their kid. 
The words you speak to your children matter. How you speak to them matters. What you think is play and sometimes isn't. And we just need to be cautious. Because sometimes what happens is, is we, we think we're just playing and picking and our children are ingraining what we're saying into their hearts. And what they can remember, what they remember when they grow up, is not that one or two times you were affirming and then doing a good job, but picking on them. I was extremely uh, blessed that my dad never did that. But I've coached basketball. I know what it's like to coach a young man who does his best, who has played his heart out, who missed a free throw or missed something, that lost the ball, threw the ball away, did something, and lost the game. And I watched a parent pick that game apart. And I would say, especially dads, be careful. Because your children will think they're never, nothing they do is ever good enough. We have to be careful. Don't embitter, don't make them lose heart. I read this week, somebody was talking about the rights of children. And, and the word here, obey, doesn't really give any, any idea that the children have rights. But someone, I just read this and I, I wrote it down, I thought it was really good. Um, because there are some rights that children have. They have the right to be born. Children have the right to be born. In our own state house, they just passed a, a bill, a heartbeat bill, saying that when a child's heartbeat is hearable, when you, I don't know if that's the right word, but when you can hear the heartbeat, you can no longer abort the child. And I believe the Bible teaches that life begins at conception. But we will, we will see a huge fight with that. We will see a huge fight with that. And it won't always be consistent in the church either. Because even as just a couple of weeks ago, Planned Parenthood on the east side of Columbus had pastors of churches praying prayers of blessing over their new building. Listen, don't think that even in the church that everybody agrees that children have a right to be born. They have a right to be born. They have a right to have a dedicated Christian home where they will be raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, Ephesians 6 4. God never intended for children to be raised in a home with an alcoholic dad and mom. They never, he never intended for them to be raised in a home where Christ was in the center. He never intended it. He intended for children to be raised by parents who know and love God. They have the right to have godly parents who pursue Christ, who will teach them the word of God and discipline them in love. But that's the way God intended it. And you have that right because God intended it that way, not because the Constitution says it or doesn't say it. A child not learning to obey his parents will likely grow up to not obey, obey any authority. Sometimes we, we as parents want our kids to be our friends more than we want them to be our children. God didn't call us to raise friends. He called us to raise children into adults. I wrote this statement down. I'm not good enough, probably not bold enough to write it, but I, I, I'll read it. In general, children do not create problems. They only reveal them. That hurt. Generally, children don't create problems. They just reveal problems that are already there. Look, the pursuit of Christ in parenting will always direct a child toward God. Pursuing Christ in our parenting points our children toward Christ. That's what happens when we pursue Christ in our parents. They still have to make the choice to follow Him, to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. But when we pursue Christ in our parenting, it points our kids to Him. 
And lastly, servants and masters. Chapter 3, 22 through 4, 1, it talks about slaves and masters. And we could go off on a great big long tangent about slavery in, in the Bible. In the Roman Empire, households included everyone that the head of the house was responsible for, including servants. So if you had people serving in your home, and in your, in your, on your farm, or whatever, you were responsible for them spiritually too. And we know that from the text, and we know from the book of Philemon, that Onesimus was a slave who came to faith in Christ after running away. And the Apostle Paul led him to faith in Christ in Rome, and he sent him back to make right with Philemon, his owner. And the Apostle Paul, when he wrote that letter to Philemon, he said, he's now your brother. Paul assumed that the people in your house, if you were a follower of Christ, everybody in your house was hearing the gospel, and people were responding. The church was made up of not just the owners, but the servants too. The part of your household it was estimated to be 60 million slaves. Most of them were victims of war. Slavery was a political thing as a result of war. It was an economic thing because people would sell themselves into slavery because they couldn't afford to live on their own. It wasn't a racial thing. But some people sometimes say, well, why doesn't the Gospels, why, don't they, why doesn't the New Testament speak out against slavery? It's never the intent of the Gospel to deal with people's stuff here, it's to deal with people's sin and to free us from sin. That's the primary purpose. But the reality is that everywhere the gospel has been, slavery gets eradicated. When people get right with God, they don't feel like they own anybody. It happens. Everywhere the gospel goes, it eventually has happened. Paul uses the word here, the same word obey as with children. Doesn't he use the word submit? He uses the word obey. He urges people who are working for somebody else to work with all their heart. In fact, he, he uses a term here that says, out of your soul, do your work. Do your work and do it with diligence out of a heart for God. And he tells them, when you work for somebody else, we're going to have to get past the slavery thing for just a moment. When you work for somebody else, he says, work as unto the Lord. You're working for God under them. Out of your soul. He gives three motives. First, he gives us God's reward. He says in verse 24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of inheritance. I promise you God can give you way more better rewards than any earthly person could. The second reason is God Christ sovereignty. Because it's the Lord Christ who you serve. It, it's not Jesus on the cross. It is the reigning Lord Jesus Christ. Whom you serve. And then he says, justice is coming. See, sometimes what happens is we get focused on trying to exert justice ourselves. When we get treated unfairly or we feel we've been treated unfairly, we forget about the fact God does justice way better than you or I could. And he's telling people when they work for someone else, do it heartily, out of your soul, to the Lord. He's the one you're really working for. He's the one who will give you the reward. He's soft. He, he's over. He knows where you are. When you feel like you're being mistreated at work, He knows where you are, and He's also eventually going to execute justice. As we get to the end of this, I love how the message says this. Being a follower of Jesus doesn't cover up bad work. In fact, it only accentuates bad work. When someone claims to be a follower of Christ, that you're a bad employer, or you don't do good work, or as 
Paul says that you only work hard when someone's watching. When that's the case, you, you make it bad not just on yourself, but on your witness. He ends this section of the text in verse 1 of chapter 4. Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. Slaves in this context had no rights. It would be absurd for the Apostle Paul, if he was supporting slavery, to talk to the people who owned slaves or had people serving and working for them to say, treat them with justice and fairness. That was absurd in the culture. But not with those pursuing Christ. So if you have people working under you that you're responsible for, the, the Bible would teach, the Apostle Paul and the Scripture, God would teach us, treat them with fairness and justice. Treat the people working for you fair. In the New Testament it says, the labor is worthy of his hire. Pay them a fair wage. Treat them well. One of the things I love about our Southern Baptist um, bookstores, I don't know, some of you may not know this, but Lifeway Christian Bookstores are a Southern Baptist entity. It's a nonprofit, so they take them, any money they make and put it back into mission. Um, but their headquarters in Nashville is regularly voted one of the top two to three places to work in all of Tennessee. Wouldn't you think that should be the case? It should be one of the best places to work. If you got people pursuing Christ. But here's the thing. If you own a business, if you own a business, you should treat the people who work with you for you under your supervision with fairness and justice. You should try to provide the fairest place to work. Does that mean you tolerate people stealing from you or people not showing up to work? No. Because that's not fair to the other people. I experienced that after college. I was working in Indiana in a, a TV manufacturing facility, about 3,000 employees. And the claim to fame that they gave me was I fired 52 people in 53 weeks. I know that's real popular right there. And on Sundays, I was at Sunny Crest Baptist Church on TV Live. That made it really pretty difficult when you come into it. You believe in that grace stuff, but you don't have any to me. Those are hard deals. But what I had to learn was when somebody had been warned, and then they had been warned again, and then they had been suspended, and they kept not showing up to work, I wasn't being unfair to them. I was being unfair to all the people they worked with. So if you're somebody for whom people work and they work under you, treating people with fairness and justice as he's talking about here, is not just about the individual, but to the group as a whole. I love what the Apostle Paul reminds those who work for others and those who supervise or own a business. In 1 Corinthians 7, 22, he reminds them that Christian slaves were free in the Lord. And that the master were slaves to Christ. When we get that in proper perspective, it really does make a difference. The pursuit of Christ at work is worship. When's the last time you went to work and you thought of the things you would do that day as an act of worship to God? And all that I do today, I will do to the honor and the glory of the one who gave his life for me. When's the last time you walked into the office or the construction site or the warehouse or the farm or wherever you were? When's the last time you walked in there and said, everything I do today, I do as an act of worship to the one who gave everything for me? You think it would change the way you were? And see, culture would tell us to go and work, and there's this ladder thing called ladder of success. We've got to climb it. 
We need to do things, position ourselves, and network ourselves. And look, I believe God blesses you with the network you need if you just open to having friends. I, I found everybody wants a friend. Now, networking is not about strategy. Networking is about just being a friend to people and being friendly. But would you walk tomorrow in the place where you were, or the place where you go to school? Would you walk into school tomorrow and say, everything I do today is going to be an act of worship to Jesus? What would happen if you walked into your home this afternoon and said, everything I do, the way that I treat my husband and my wife is going to be an act of worship to Jesus? Kids, what if you went home today? Or you went to dinner, whatever you're doing with your parents, and you said, everything I do today, I do as an act of worship to Jesus. We hear this morning, you're a follower of Christ. This instruction is consistent with the Old Testament and all the New Testament. There's nothing unique here. It's consistent. And it's consistent because it's consistent with the character and the plan of God. It's God's plan. It's not my plan. It's God's plan. I can find a way more popular plan. But this is God's plan. The question I had to grapple with, and the question you got to grapple with this morning is, am I wholly submitted because of my relationship with Christ and my pursuit of Christ to submit to God's plan for my life? The truth is, is this plan really can only work the way it's meant to work. If we understand that God may love that Jesus Christ displayed for us. So if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ your personal Lord and Savior, everything is about our relationship with Him. Your, your potential success in your family, in your marriage, in parenting, at work, all depends on Jesus. Hope is found only in him. I'm going to pray. And then we're going to sing. We're going to sing a song that just reminds us that everything we have, everything that we are, everything that we hope for is found in Christ. And when we're done, I'm going to say it again. We're going to go home. The question is going to be, are we going to go live the text? We're going to go live the lesson because it's God's lesson for us. It's for me. It's for me. It's not for somebody else. And it's God's plan. It's not something I made up or anybody else made up. Are you pursuing Christ and His plan for your life and your family? And if you're here this morning and never trusted Christ, you can do that today. He died on the cross for you to pay your sin debt so that He can make you part of His forever family. And you can to place your faith in Him. Stop following your own way and follow and trust Him. Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness and your uh, provision and all that you give us. Thank you for your word. Lord, I, I know this, this message this morning is not the most motivating message um, uh, from a positive or encouraging way. But God, we need it. And you know we need it because you put it there for us. So Lord, would you help us to live it and understand that pursuing Christ it only happens when we live by the power of your spirit consistent with your word going forward together in the context of faith and work and all of that entails from your word. God, will we respond today in obedience to you and surrender to your plan. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you stand?
about our pursuit of Christ in our families and in our work. And that we would do that as an act of worship to you. Trusting you, God, following your plan, God, for the glory of the one who gave all for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said.